our third presentation. I'm very happy to introduce you our next speaker, Eric Bale, on a stage. <sighs> Eric uh, has in his success record such very successful games like the Fear franchise or the Lost Planet. Now he's working in the Arcane Studios uh, in Austin, Texas as the lead environment artist. And uh, he will tell us today how he and his team um, worked on uh, the most recent released game, The Prey, and how they created an environmental, um, what is it? The space station, Talos yeah. one. Executed in the game. So yeah. please welcome again and good luck. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Eric Bale. I'm the lead environment artist at Arcane Studios. Uh, I graduated uh, magna cum laude at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale uh, back in 2005. And I was actually the very first person to ever graduate with the game art and design degree at my school. Um, and before going to art school, I actually was in another industry. I worked in the computer industry. But every night I would come home and I would mod games like Half-Life and Quake. Um, and it all changed when a friend told me about a game called Thief the Dark Project. Um, some of you might be fans. Um, I started playing it and I was like really immersed by the world and I was blown away by how detailed it was and, uh, and how personal it all felt. And it was then that I realized that I needed to change careers. Like I wanted to uh, make people feel the way that I felt playing that game uh, and I knew I needed to step up my modding to, you know, to, to be better. So I went to art school. Uh, pursued my dream, becoming a video game developer. Um, and my first job, and ever since my first job, I've focused on environmental storytelling at every studio and every game that I've ever worked on. Um, on Fear 3, for example, uh, because of the storytelling that we added to our levels, uh, my designer and I were asked to uh, remake several earlier levels that weren't quite as successful. Uh, and then on Lost Planet 3, after I finished my level there, it was pretty successful, and the creative director asked me to go in and create vignettes for all of the um, memento pickups, which were personal items hidden throughout the game, uh, which told you the backstory about the characters that created them, uh, or that un owned them, sorry. Uh, I came to Arcane Studios because they're recognized as world-renowned world builders and storytellers, and I wanted to join a studio that held those same values. Um, Dishonored impressed me like it impressed a lot of people, and on Prey, we were given the chance to continue that legacy with a mostly new team in our Austin studio. Uh, I'm lucky because not only am I allowed to focus on environmental story storytelling, I'm actually uh, expected to. Uh, Prey is the culmination of a lot of hard work from a team of people that believe in these values and have believed in them for entire careers. And I'm excited to show some of it to you today. Uh, now, before I begin, I just want to say that I'm going to be showing examples from the entire game, but uh, I'm not going to be spoiling any major plot points uh, outside of what you can already play in the demo. <clears throat> All right, so what is environmental storytelling? So my definition is the execution of universe building. Uh, when we create video games, we're creating living, breathing worlds. Uh, if done well, we're creating histories from before the player ar arrived there and setting up rules so that they can imagine the world after you've left it. Now, it's important to note, I think, that environmental storytelling includes more than just environment art. I'm an environment artist, but it, I think it generally, uh, or it, it involves many other disciplines, such as visual effects, audio, UI, concept, the writing team. Um, Similarly, you know, it's also worth noting that storytelling, it's more than just the game story or the plot, it's actually much more than that. Uh, environmental storytelling is constant and there's so much variety to it. Uh, sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's overt. Sometimes it's meaningful to the plot and other times it's just a background element for only the most attentive players to appreciate. But if you take the time to do it, it really contributes, I think, to a believable, enjoyable, and memorable playing experience. Now, <clears throat> in Prey, beyond the alien outbreak, the cool weapons, and the fancy powers, Prey is actually a game about people. It's about relationships, it's about humanity, and it's about trust. And it all takes place on a massive space station far away from the comforts of Earth. 
Now, because of the rich complexities of our story and our genre as an immersive sim, we were able to use a large box of crayons, figuratively speaking, to draw our picture. Um, other genres or other games might be limited or limited in different ways, um, so it's like you're using a smaller box of crayons. But even then, you still have everything you need to draw a pretty picture. Um, I think to neglect these tools completely is to neglect the value of the player's long-term emotional uh, investment in the game. Uh, players who care about the place that they're fighting in or uh, the character they're fighting as, I think, are more likely to have memorable experiences that last with them long after the match has ended. So there's many, there are many ways to uh, tell a story through the world you're creating. Uh, what I'm about to show you is by no means all of them, but it does include what I feel are the most important and most effective. So let's start off by, uh, with what you usually need to know or to do in order to create a level. Um, you need to have identity, you need to give it a background, if you can support the objectives, explain gameplay, and show generally what happened here. Um, so for example here, we've got uh, a server room. First is like identify what the room is and make it look like it. Uh, what's the function or purpose of the room? What's the job of the person that works here? Um, this one was pretty simple. We add servers, some cables, some overhead ventilation. Looks like a server room. Uh, next is background or history. Is this room new or old? Uh, how much wear and tear would it see on a regular basis? Uh, is there any backstory you should support? Um, this particular room is the entrance to the Transtar Museum in the main lobby. Uh, Prey takes place in an alternate timeline where Kennedy was not assassinated and our President Kennedy was not assassinated and we invested heavily in the space age. So here we painted up uh, a portrait of him in his old age with gray hair. Uh, next, you might want to support major plot points or, ma or player objectives. Uh, one of the first objectives in Prey is to collect your very first Neuromod. And you come across this display stage near the skill, re uh, skill recorder area where it would be shown to world famous visitors. Uh, and you're told that the fake one on display has been swapped out by a real one by your mysterious guide. Next, you uh, might want to explain any necessary gameplay. Maybe it's a tutorial, or maybe you picked up a new weapon and need to be shown how to use it. Uh, this is where you first discover the glue cannon. Uh, next to the gun, you find this mimic encased in hardened glue, uh, teaching you what the weapon does, basically. Um, and this is really good, because right around the corner, you're about to be ambushed by a whole bunch of mimics. Now, usually in most games, something goes wrong either before the player got there or after they arrived, and you can do some basic world building using sort of generic techniques uh, like these, uh, death, destruction that can be used without explaining really much of anything beyond the obvious that something bad happened here. Uh, blood splatters, bloody footprints, explosions, fire, just general mayhem, uh, just to name a few, but just remember, these are just a starting point. All right, so now you've done all these things, you've got a level, um, it's functional, it's fine, but it's not particularly memorable and it's not really gonna win any awards, I don't think, um, but you've got a level, so that's like a really good starting point. So, all right, so what's the point of this slide? Uh, well, everybody knows 90% of an iceberg is the extra part under the water, so naturally 90% of what makes your level special is the extra stuff you add to it after you've made it. These are some more advanced methods of environmental storytelling that I believe were the most successful on Prey. Uh, and I'm gonna go over each of these with examples. Um, but first I'm putting Talos 1 back in space where it belongs. Um, all right, so let's start with uncovering mystery because Prey starts off with a lot of mystery if you've played it. Uh, when you begin the game, you realize very quickly that things are not quite as they seem. Uh, questions build and you start seeking answers immediately. You believe you're in your luxurious high-rise apartment overlooking our fictional version of San Francisco until you discover that you aren't. Apparently, you've been inside a simulation the entire time, being studied like a rat in a cage. Now, at this point, players are probably wondering several things. Where am I actually? Uh, did all the crazy events I just witnessed actually happen, or were those simulations also? Why was I in this simulation in the first place? Uh, will I even get to space like I was promised um, now that I'm in this weird warehouse? Uh, Prey, unlike a lot of games, you actually start inside of a level and work your way out of it at the very beginning. 
Um, and that's when you're presented with your next big reveal. You've been in space the entire time. And then you later find out that you uh, have been working on the station for years. You just don't remember it. And you even put yourself in the simulation. So right off the bat, there's just a lot of mystery trying to figure out all these, the answers to these questions. So as artists and designers, it's up to us to show that visually. And sometimes it's challenging because it's, that's a lot of information and it's really challenging uh, and complex and we have to do it clearly and visually. Um, now here's the fun part about this is that uh, we included several clues hidden right under the player's nose right from the very beginning of the game, uh, which if you were paying attention, you might have figured out that something was not quite right. So let's go back to the game start, where you first exit your apartment and head down the hall to catch the helicopter waiting for you on the rooftop. Uh, you pass the maintenance worker fixing a leaky pipe. She says hello to you. Attentive players may have noticed the conspicuous scuff marks on the floor, uh, the one long one dividing there, and then there's a little half circle right there. Even if you do notice them, though, you probably didn't really think too hard about it, right? You're trying to catch a helicopter, you've got objectives, you're kind of moving along. Now, after witnessing something pretty traumatic on your first day of work, you wake up in your apartment again with the same music, the same date on the radio clock, uh, the same song playing. Uh, you, but this time you step out of your apartment and there's a wall there that wasn't there before. And of course, the lighting is way more dramatic. Um, you might make the connection to the scuff marks at this point, but I doubt it because you're probably distracted by the fact that there's a wall there now and there's a dead body on the floor and somebody's contacting you telling you that it's dangerous and you got to get out of there. Um, but once you do break out of your apartment, you definitely start to put it all together when you see the, the walls spinning and sliding to transform the room from one room to another. Um, watching people's reaction to this on YouTube, by the way, is actually really funny the first time they see it. Then we reveal that the helicopter that you rode to work is totally fake, like an amusement park. And then the next room you go to is, just like the last one, is also totally fake. Uh, just like the apartment, the elevator you ride never actually moves. We close the door, we shake the camera a little bit, we put some UI on screen and, it, and sounds, and it makes it feel like you're moving, but it's not really. We're just transforming the room right outside. Now, as you can see, none of it's fake, none of it's developer fakery. It's all architecturally and engineering-wise perfectly you know, functional uh, because we actually show this to you in the game, so we need it to work properly. Um, but the funny thing is, so we don't hide the details, right? We could have easily made that seamless when the wall panels go into the floor or into the wall, but we chose to not. We made sure to leave the seams there so that attentive players, if they were paying attention, could have walked and saw that. Nobody does, though. Everybody's so focused on the next objective that they don't pay attention. When literally moments ago, there was a giant sign right there, and now it's not. More clues we leave right under the player's nose is actually during the very first testing sequences. Um, as you move room to room, you can see your apartment in the background, um, but it's, a, it's kind of obscured by window blinds. What's not obscured, however, there's a giant sign up there that says Simulation Labs. Um, I don't think people ever notice it, though, because uh, you're busy failing the tests and you're kind of frustrated by that, so everybody's focused on that. Um, for reinforcement, we walk, we walk you right past the sign after you've escaped the simulation, and I always wonder how many people make that connection to be like, could I see that from the test room? And then they go back and replay it, and they could totally see it from the test room. So next, visual design. Let's talk about visual design. So um, visual design, people think a lot about art style or you know, art direction, and it's true, it is that. Um, but I think it goes beyond that as well. Uh, a lot of the choices you make have a profound effect on the, uh, what the players feel or experience as they play your level. Um, they also provide clarity and consistency for the rules that you've, that you've created for, your, uh, for the world. Uh, pe for example, people generally expect space stations to be tight and oppressive, uh, but TELUS 1 is typically not. Um, our choices tell the player what kind of a company Transtar is. Impressive, grand, opulent, right? They spare no expense. Um, our ceilings were generally seven meters high or higher. Uh, our choice of materials, wood, marble, gold, um, especially in the public facing side of things. Transtar is the kind of company that builds a giant park at the top of their space station for the employees. They fill it with huge rock walls and flowing waterfalls. 
However, when you start to explore the Arboretum Park uh, behind the scenes, you discover that the mountainous rocks are actually fake. Uh, they're held up by wooden planks and plaster, um, again, like you'd find at a theme park. Also, that waterfall is just another looking glass illusion like the city was in your apartment. Now, I should say we do have tight, cramped spaces like you'd find on a space station. Um, they just tend to be behind the scenes or deeper into the, into the ship. Another thing we emphasize at Arcane is a saying, say yes to the player. Now, what this means is, reasonably speaking, if the player thinks they can do it, we try to let them do it. We, we make sure that we can do it, that they can do it. Flushing toilets and turning on sinks seem like throwaway actions, but they actually provide the player a sense of world through immersion and agency. If somebody walks up and flushes the toilet, they're like, oh, that was cool, and they move on. But if they go and it doesn't work, people are like, oh. So we try to do that whenever we can. Now, the, real, the, uh, the fact of the matter is we can't let players actually do whatever they want, so we have to make visual design choices to uh, make it clear when they can't do something. Um, and sometimes that's as simple as just changing the color of something or removing things like handles so it doesn't look like it's interactive. On occasion, we can incorporate our interactive props into the gameplay, uh, such as with the side quest Psychic Water. Um, in that quest, you can alter the station's water system so that it recharges your psi meter when you drink from any of the water fountains. So, uh, all right, so I think it's important to explain gameplay as part of your base pass, as I showed a few minutes ago, um, but I think it's just as important to reinforce it throughout the world. One, it helps ground these ideas as if the people living or working there were also using them. And two, it also reminds the player that these mechanics exist, or that new mechanics exist. When you per first pick up the glue cannon, we showed you the glued mimic, so you learned what to do with it, right? But later, we have this in-game cinematic where a man is being attacked by a phantom, and he sprays a stream of glue to create a staircase to climb up to try and get away from it. Uh, this reintroduces the weapon that you already have and shows you new ways to use it um, if you haven't already figured that out. The Hunter's Bolt Caster is another weapon in the game. It's kind of a tool, um, but you can find it in a few places on Talos 1. And in an email uh, you find on a workstation, a scientist mentions that a group of them play uh, using the dart guns, they go to the Arboretum and they play like an assassin's style dart gun game, uh, which explains why they made the gun in the first, first place. Uh, you also later learn that the darts affect screens because of a special material they put on the tip, um, which is a useful mechanic for you to learn as a player. Um, and in this scene here, up in the rafters, there's a fort where one of the scientists hangs out above everybody else and just kind of shoots them from above bringing the Assassin's game that they play at the park to work. As you enter hardware labs, there's a demonstration theater just around the corner there, which is fictionally is, exists to uh, show employees or uh, VIP visitors Transtar's latest scientific advancements. On the, along the way, you'll find posters like this one, uh, which lists some of the upcoming demonstrations. Uh, such as gravity lifts, the science behind how you get t around Telos 1 quickly and safely, and looking glass, teleconferencing will never be the same. Now, both of these things are technology that you experience as a player and use as a player, and by doing things like these posters just grounds it into the world to say, the people that work here also use them. We didn't just make it up for the player. Now, as we saw from that last image, some of these examples fit into multiple categories, like posters. Uh, signage is a simple but valuable way to provide information to the player, whether it's to help with navigation or to strengthen ideas within the game. We spend a lot of time at Arcane iterating our levels to make sure that they're as sensible and as clear as they can be to the player, so we hope to minimize players getting lost. However, Telus One is a massive, complex, interconnected station, so we want to make sure we provide players the tools to find what they're looking for in the event that they need it. Um, plus, it's expected that the people working here would also require such signage, just as you'd expect it when you went to the airport. Um, every sign and prey is accurate. Uh, we have a lot of them, and they always serve a purpose. 
I think this is an important aspect that a lot of game developers just sort of skip out on. Um, but I think players really appreciate when they can't figure out what to, to do, if they can look at a sign, oh, okay, I'm not lost anymore, great. Another great example of signs that go beyond navigation are the soundstage rules, uh, billboards. Now you see these once you break out of your apartment, and they're in a couple places. Now at first glance, it seems like a simple way to just reinforce that the area is fake, like a movie set, um, with a few reminders for the people that work there. It is that, but it, it's actually even more. See, so when I was making this sign, um, I was able to make an in-game fictional decision to explain an out-of-game technical problem that we were having. When you ride that helicopter to work that first day, we needed to make sure we deleted any objects that you may have brought with you from your apartment to the helipad, because of course the helicopter ride's fake, and if you got out of your helicopter and the chair that you brought with you was still sitting there, it would re uh, ruin the illusion too soon. So we had to do a little you know, developer cheating and delete the objects. So what I did was I added one of the bullet points on the sign says, make sure to clear the rooftop of any stray objects during the simulated flight. This implies that there's a worker whose job it is to do that. That's why those objects disappear during your flight, not just because a game designer scripted it. We also use signage as pure flavor, just sort of to explain backstory. Uh, here's a conference room, for example. We have a slide on a projector that it's from a new employee orientation, just showing how top employees are eligible to receive neuromods. Pretty simple. Propaganda signs also work great in a game like Prey. Uh, the company that created the, the, the space station, Transtar, big mega corporation, propaganda is always good there. Um, it's a constant reminder, these, these signs are a constant reminder that Talos, or that Transtar rather, is a scientifically advanced com company. They're very proud of their advancements. But the one in the bottom right shows that ultimately they do control everything on the space station and the employees need to be reminded of that on occasion. And of course, how can we talk about signage without mentioning the fan favorite, not a mimic note? Um, mimics are alien, uh, one of the aliens in the game, and they can shapeshift into everyday objects, uh, like coffee mugs, for example, and, and attack you. Uh, we already had the idea of sticky notes in the game as a means for designers to communicate text, like passwords for computers, um, but one day one of the level designers came to me and said, hey, uh, could you make me a special note that says, not a mimic? Okay, why? He said, well, I want to put them all over this one room, uh, all over objects where a scientist basically goes crazy trying to tag everything that he knows is safe because he's so terrified of the mimics. Um, recognizing how great that idea was, I stopped what I was doing and made it for him right that minute. All right, personal touches. Uh, personal touches are, are what I believe to be the most important of all these categories. They're what make the game feel real, like real people actually lived there. Some of the choices uh, were made, some choices were made really early on by our designers uh, which, and our writers, which really helped the level teams during development. For example, we knew that there would be around 200 people that worked and lived aboard the station. Every single one of them has a name, a job, a place where they sleep, a place where they work. You can find you know, all of these places in the game. We were able to use these details and many others to tell some of the stories. But first, of course, you play as Morgan Yu, uh, but you get to choose what gender Morgan is when the game starts. Depending on your choice, several assets change in your apartment, such as the pictures uh, in your family photo, the newspaper clipping, uh, the type of shoes you have, whether you have a purse or a messenger bag, the colors of your walls. Your decor also changes. We made sure to make stylish design choices instead of cliched ones. Uh, we went with softer shapes from the female Morgan and a more uh, stark pattern for the male Morgan. As Morgan's heritage is half Chinese, I chose to make sure that their shoes were on a mat by the front door, as is customary of their culture. This is a subtle character detail that maybe a lot of people don't notice, um, but then we have more obvious details such as an Asian cookbook in the kitchen and Chinese New Year envelopes in the closet. So a couple of us actually play baseball outside of work, um, and we thought it would be fun to put a baseball glove in the game as one of the pickups, something you can recycle. Um, 
you can find it in all sorts of places, including trash cans. Uh, at first it would seem a little weird and random. Why would you find a whole bunch of baseball gloves on a space station? Um, it is until you find all the clues in the environment that I created to support one of the ideas that the writers, one of the writers thought up, um, starting with an employee profile that he wrote. First, in one of the readable magazines, you'll find an employee profile of Harley Granger, a retired professional baseball player who's now a Transtar salesman stationed on Talos One. Later, in the sales division, you can find his desk, and you'll find a baseball glove and a pennant of the 2027 Tornadoes, the team that he won the league championship with, which you read about in his bio. Later, you find his bunk where he sleeps, and you find his journal and read it, and you discover that he brought a box of signed baseball gloves with him on his very first day to give out to employees as gifts. Unfortunately, they're all a bunch of scientists, and they didn't really follow sports, so they didn't really even know who he was. Kind of depressing. Um, but that's also why you find them in trash cans. They were, thank you so much, and, and they just throw it away. Um, like I said, the whole thing's kind of sad, um, but don't worry. Way off the beaten path in the Arboretum Park, uh, way deep in the forest, you can find an area with a home plate, a pitcher's mound, a couple of baseball gloves, and, and pizza and beer. So I think it's safe to say that Harley at least found one person on the space station that liked baseball, and he got to play catch with them. Now, what's interesting about these vignettes is that none of them have any quests associated with them. They don't contribute to the story, the plot of the game at all. They only exist to tell a layered backstory of a background character in order to make life on the station more real and more believable, to make the station feel like a real place. Another character in the game is Dr. Calvino. He's the scientist who created the looking glass technology, which is the tech used to simulate a 3D image through a window. He ha when you find his room in crew quarters, he's got the original prototype there, and you find that he was actually recreating a miniature diorama of the Italian seaside village that he grew up in. Um, again, it just gives you a little bit of backstory of who he is, where he came from. He misses home, and so he's recreating this world. Um, also, on a nearby screen in his room, we reinforce that the tech runs in a 3D editor, just like us at game designers, as game designers. Um, this is Abigail Foy's room. Uh, she was in a romantic relationship with the head of the IT department, Danielle Show, And here we show where they last hung out together playing video games and sharing dinner. Um, pretty subtle, it's just a nice sort of romantic personal moment. Uh, back in hardware labs, behind a metal divider, you can find a snowman that's made out of glue balls. Um, and next to it uh, is a, an email, uh, a computer with an email with an email sent from the night shift to the day shift, telling them how the baseball glove hands they added was a personal, uh, a, a excellent finishing touch. Uh, the sticky note behind the glue man over here, uh, when you click on that, reveals that his name is, of course, Gluey McGlueface. Uh, and the whole scene is just like the Hunter's Boltcaster one. It just kind of shows you that, like, even super serious scientists working on a space station need to goof off at work a little bit. Throughout the game, you'll find several emails and other clues about a group of employees that play a Dungeons & Dragons-style role-playing game in the crew quarters. Later, when you finally get there, you're able to, or you find the table where they play. Here you see the Dungeon Master screen, some multi-sided dice, the game's rule book, and of course, pizza. In the IT department, they don't have room for an official desk for a security officer named Akande Benin, so they put together a makeshift one in a stairwell. He's not happy about it, so he passive-aggressively duct tapes his name to the wall. These are just a small fraction of the personal touches that you can find all over Talos One. Easter eggs. Uh, so Easter eggs are less about supporting the in-game story and more about supporting the community with homage or inside jokes. These types of things are worth doing for the fans, and they're really fun to do as developers. Here are some. Of course, the 451 code, which, if you don't know, has a long history in similar games such as Deus Ex, System Shock, Bioshock, and Dishonored, just to name a few. Speaking of Dishonored, the piano 
uh, from Dishonored made a cameo in our skill recorder room. In the crew quarters, we have a movie theater, and one of the movies playing features Arcane's founder and president, Raf Colantonio, as the star, painted up in Dishonored concept art style. His name and all the names in the credits are anagrams of, all the, or, or of several of the artists and designers on the team. The RPG game that I mentioned earlier is called Fatal Fortress, which is English for the Latin Arx Fatalis, which some of you might recognize as Arcane's very first game. We didn't stop there. We used the same font. Uh, the game rules that you can read describe the combat system from Arx. The game maps are the same, and the character sheets share a lot of the same details. Speaking of Arx Vitalis, the karaoke bar in the crew quarters is named the Yellow Tulip after the bar of the same name in Arx Vitalis. The bartender named Tizzy can also be found in this bar, but this time she's a destroyed operator robot. The character named Danielle Sho is a tip of the cap to Shodan from System Shock. In earlier drafts of the story, she played a much different role. And finally, the Looking Glass technology. Uh, it's not a direct reference to the Looking Glass Studios, like a lot of you might think, but rather the original thing that they were paying homage to, the Alice in Wonderland through the Looking Glass stories by Lewis Carroll. With that said, though, I think it's pretty obvious that we at Arcane have reverence for Looking Glass Studios, so we definitely don't fault anybody for thinking that. These were all examples of what worked for us on Prey, uh, and I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, I'd like to give you some tips now on just sort of how to actually, actually execute some of these ideas. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning, but it's worth repeating here. Environmental storytelling is a process that involves many parts of the creative team. Everything I showed you today was the work of many people in many disciplines. You have to have a studio culture that believes in and promotes these values. I know that art and design can sometimes have a friendly rivalry. Sometimes there's value in that, like trying to push to make a gameplay idea or level layout as good as it can be. But when it comes to the storytelling layer, you have to come together to create a cohesive vision. Artists should recognize that their job is to support the narrative as best that they can, and designers hopefully recognize that artists can have excellent ideas, uh, ideas on how to implement or further an idea and even come up with ideas of their own. I think it's super important that you familiarize yourself with the story, the characters, the missions, the objectives as early as possible. Read all of the in-game text that your designers or writers write. An artist's job is to create the world the best way he or she can, and one way to maximizing that is to make sure you have all the information. Otherwise, you're just leaving opportunities on the table. Ownership of an environmental story, story should probably be handled by one person if it spans across multiple maps to make sure that that vision is executed. Coordinate and communicate that with your teammates. Production needs to also understand that this phase of development is vitally important for the game and, and schedule time dedicated for it. Though a lot of these elements are added at the end of the project, you can't take it for granted and just cram in unplanned ideas at the end and expect them to be as good as they can be. On a similar note, you will need to absolutely have unique props in order to storytell. There are times when reuse is okay, but be careful. That reuse can take away from the uniqueness from the scene which was as intend it was intended. Um, make sure you budget your levels accordingly so that you have room to put some of these objects. It's also really important to do a, th a few things while you're creating your vignettes. Space them out so you don't get too much information at once, or go too long without uncovering a new one. Make sure your lighting and locations put them in the best possible light, unless you need them to be in the background or the shadows. It's all about presentation. So why should you value environmental storytelling? Players are always looking to make a connection with the games that they play. Sometimes that's through story or characters. Other times it's through addicting or engaging gameplay. But regardless of the reason and regardless of the genre, environmental storytelling gives developers the means to make their world richer and deeper to give players more chances to get hooked into the world that you've created. 
Whether you realize it or not, as developers, you have an opportunity to leave players with an impression that can last them a lifetime. And in the process, you might even inspire somebody the way that I was inspired and so many others were by games that do it really well. You might even help to create the next generation of environmental storytellers. Thank you. So if, if you haven't played uh, Prey yet, now you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we will reach you with mics. Um, hello, uh, thank you for the great presentation and for the great game. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, so uh, you've mentioned uh, the uh, Danielle Shaw and her D&D sessions, and there was this one part where she gave uh, a quest to all the D&D players. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would like to ask whose brilliant idea it was, <laughs> and uh, uh, how do you actually, well, communicate it and work together with, I don't know, game designers, mm -hmm. quest designers to do this sort of experience. Sure. So that actually, that quest came from our lead designer, uh, Rich Wilson. Uh, a lot of people at Arcane play, like at lunchtime, we play RPG games and stuff. So uh, I think somebody had, uh, I don't know, if, I think it was Rich's idea originally, he wanted to do it. Um, and then it just evolved into this like really complex series of missions and uh, objectives that you find. And like I said, I showed you some of them. Um, but the collaboration was very much, Rich came to the you know, art team and was like, we want to do this, and so we just collaborated on where do we, you know, how, what do we want to show, which, which levels do we want to show it in, and um, yeah, that one you, you pick up uh, the, the treasure maps, right, and you have to like, you know, figure out where in the actual game you are. Yeah, that was, that was pretty much all Rich and the design team. Hi. Thank you. Hello, hi. Over here. Oh. Over, over here. Oh, hi. hi. Yes. <laughs> hi. Uh, can you share a little bit about uh, how you came uh, about the architectural designs? Like um, during the concept stage, what kind of architecture do you guys, did your team look at? And during the concept stage, um, uh, what do you throw away? What do you keep? And uh, so, what made you decide to keep and design this style that you have mm -hmm. in the game? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, so uh, it, it really sort of all started, we have uh, our visual design director, Manu Pettit. Uh, he sort of, you know, is sort of like acts as the art director. Um, he worked on Dishonored, and so he came from that kind of school. Uh, one of the first things we did was we had to figure out, well, what, what era does the game take place in? And while the game is technically takes place in the future, 2030, we knew that we wanted to have a kind of retro style to it. Um, and the era is essentially, right, the space age revolution. And so, you know, we kind of went back and did a lot of research to like the 1950s, 1960s, 60s, sort of mid-century, um, and just started looking for uh, really interesting designers, architects, uh, technology makers, you know, companies like IBM were just getting started with their machines. And if you've ever seen the original IBM 360, it's this just large cabinet of a computer. But it's really stylishly designed. It's got bright, bold colors and stuff like that. Um, and we kind of just went from there. And then what we did was, well, we're in the future, so we had to layer on technology. So it was this kind of really nice mix between the old retro and a future technology. So we, the main style in our game, we call it Neo Deco. It's like sort of our version of, of Art Deco. We kind of took some Art Deco stylings and modernized it. So it had some of the like sim simpler, uh, minimal designs. Um, and yeah, we went from there. And yeah, we worked with Concept and uh, our architects who are uh, sort of 3D concept artists and world builders. Um, to, yeah, to get what you see. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hey. Thank you for your great speech. Um, like, imagine we are creating a level, mm -hmm. and we are uh, then adding some props, mm -hmm. uh, as, you, as you said, uh, the personal touches and mm -hmm. other important stuff. And, like, everything of that is essential, but at some point you find out that it's overwhelming. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff uh, for the player mm -hmm. to... Uh, explore and uh, what can we do with that? Um, yeah, that's a great question too. So, uh, you know, part of what I was saying is you have to be able to space things out so you don't get too much information at once. Um, I think a lot of it is getting an understanding of what is the story that you're trying to tell 
and only tell that story. Don't try to layer on a bunch of extra stuff that the story doesn't really need. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, the other is just play test, right? It, make sure that players play it. If they and ask them questions, did you see this? What did you think about this? What did you think it meant? You know, and they'll tell you. And if it's not what you think, then you need to go back and figure out how to make it better. Um, but uh, and collaborate, like I said, designers, artists, you know, work together. You know, because somebody will have an idea and be like, oh, I didn't even think about it from that angle, um, and then you kind of approach it from there. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Are there any alternatives to reading emails? Uh, for example, if I do know that uh, it's not... Um, uh, so I, I know, for example, uh, you can enter a passco uh, uh, passcode to enter some email or some something on the smartphone, so you don't need to read some information, so it's not necessary. Can I avoid it? Uh, can you name an altern alternative of, of uh, reading emails in the game? Because we all know that there are some uh, like uh, limits uh, sure. where an, uh, a smartphone blocks you because you need to ch in put in the password and uh, the computer can block you because you also need to know a password. Anything right. else? Um, so al alternatives too? or um, I, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people... I'm an artist, and so for me, I prefer visual aids, right? I want to be able to show you something without you having to read it because it translates to any language, any country, whatever. But in a game like Prey, where there's so much detail and so much information, um, I think you have to use text. And so we have things like email, newspapers, magazines, you know, and stuff that you can read. Um, and I think there's value. And then what's interesting about it is that the, the designers can latch on to that and, you know, did, and so they can, you know, because if you just have, if you have in your game just a million things to read, people are probably going to tune out and not read them all. But if you start locking them behind passwords and stuff, people are now like, oh, that, I want in there. You're hiding something from me. I need to figure out how to get in there. And now all of a sudden you're doing that. The other thing that was really successful on Prey with all of our emails, and we do have a lot of them, admittedly, but why they think they work is because we tried to really create this real place, so you would find one computer where they sent the email, and then like five hours later, you would find somebody else's computer who received the email. And so it just kind of makes that connection, and so you see it, and you're like, oh yeah, I remember when so-and-so sent that email, and it just makes the whole space feel more believable and more real. Um, I hope that answered the question. Um. Hello, and um, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how do you think? Uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, what's the be what's the best way for environmental storyteller to tell their story? If uh, the game is uh, open worldly, like Prey, mm. and or is it uh, um, mission structured like Dishonored and Dark Messiah and etc. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and Prey is very open, but it's uh, sort of like Metroid or something like that, where it's, there's a lot of locked doors. So even though at the end of the game you've unlocked everything, you can go anywhere, along the way you, you know, we sort of like space out and, and prevent you from getting into certain areas, um, unless you get clever and you can find out ways around it. Um, and so... Yeah, uh, I don't know. I guess um, if you, it, it just goes back to like if you have too much information, it, it's very overwhelming, right? And I think you, it's all about pacing and spacing stuff out. And, and even in Prey that is pretty open-ended, there are moments where there's what we call hard, hard locks or hard gates, which is like, no, you, you cannot pass this point until you've you know, done at least some of the things we kind of want you to see. But we try to limit those because we like the freedom. Um, if you have something that's more structured, like a Dishonored, I, you know, I've worked on those kinds of games too. Um, I think those are generally easier because you know where the player is going to be. They start at point A, they go to point B, they go to point C, and you know how often you need to show something and, and if it's too much, if it's too little, do you, need, you know, those kinds of things. Oh, hi, oh. Uh, thank you for the, your presentation, uh, very interesting. So you uh, mentioned that 
uh, not like all players uh, see this uh, stuff uh, right right the way. Uh, so because it's just hidden somewhere, mm. uh, and a lot of them just go through the game. Uh, so uh, well, and there is like budget, there is like time, mm -hmm. and actually, do you uh, like? do something like to show the guys that they should like uh, search mm -hmm. or you, you just do it like for for the guys who will do that anyway right. like naturally right. uh, uh, yeah yeah um, that's actually a great question too um, I think it's important at the very beginning of the game to kind of show people a little bit right like at the very beginning when you're in your apartment and you're breaking out, it's pretty linear, you know? It's, it's, there's, a, there's a beginning, there's a, an a objective and an exit that's pretty linear. And then we open you up to the whole world. But during that, verse, that sequence, uh, we kind of show you this kind of game is a kind of game that you want to take your time and explore everything. Not every game is that way, right? Some games just pff, zoom past everything, and that's totally fine too. Um, but pray, we, we said very early on, like, no, we want you to slow down. And so we found, I mean, even just watching players on YouTube and Twitch and stuff, that, like, they'll start the game running and staring at the floor as they run past, because that's what they're used to doing. And then after they see a couple of interesting things, they'll change the way that they play the game. Like, oh, hold on, this is a game that I need to pay attention. And then hopefully they do that for the rest of the game. And it's up to us to keep it interesting and make it so that every so you know, so that you don't go too long without finding something interesting and then they get bored or, you know, they just move on. So that's why it's important. That's why I stress environmental storytelling a lot because it's important to have a lot of it in the game. You can't just do a little bit and then forget about it. You have to do a lot of it from the very beginning to the very end. Я могу задать вопрос? Thank you for a great game. Are there any limits between adding details to the story, but not to distract from the main story? Where is this line from this the main story and details? For example, when I play Dishonored 2 and on the first location, I start to pay attention to every detail, to read every note, every everything, but uh, I lose the dynamic of the game. So where is this line? How do you find the balance uh, of uh, um, engaging uh, the player into the actual scenario and gameplay, and between the storytelling and all those hidden aspects uh, that you would also like to introduce to a player? Mm. Because, for example, um, our attendee, um, when he enters to a new location, he is first of all trying to find all those uh, Easter eggs or all right. those messages first yeah. before actually playing the game uh, and uh, <laughs> the main scenario. Right. Um, well, as much as I love environmental storytelling, I also recognize that the reason play, people play games is to have fun and shoot things and you know those sorts of things. And so we always focus everything around um, combat scenarios, right? Uh, and once the combat scenarios are in and designed where this room, this fight is going to happen or, you know, whatever, then we go in afterwards and we layer in story in, sometimes in the combat areas, but mostly around the combat areas or in other areas so that it doesn't, so you don't end up in a scenario where you're trying to look at something and you're getting attacked, right? It's like you enter a room and it's like, okay, a fight's probably going to happen here. Um, and then when you kill everybody, then you can look around, you know, but there's other areas that's the opposite. You walk in, there's no, it's quiet, you know, whatever, and then you explore. Um, that's challenging uh, and kind of changes things up when we have a character like the Mimic, or an alien like the Mimic, which can be anywhere in the game and be disguised as any object in the game. And so even when you go into an area and be like, oh, there's no combat here, it's safe, you can start looking around and then all of a sudden a coffee mug attacks you and scares you and it's really funny and fun. So. That's kind of how we balanced it on Prey. Hello, so my question is this. Are there any elements to storytelling through environment that you rejected? I mean, people just don't notice them, it's hard to notice them, it's just a waste of time. 
Uh, can you name some of those elements in the storytelling that you decided not to in the execute in the prey uh, because they are hard to track or hard to find? Oh, examples that we didn't do? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Maybe with enough time I could, but I can't think of anything off the bat. Um, Maybe like we had um, some weapons or alien powers early in the game during prototyping, and we had ideas to support those, and then they got cut for budget reasons, or not budget, but timing reasons, or um, they just didn't turn out to be fun, and so we cut those, which means all the ideas go with that, but I don't, sorry, I don't really have any examples, um, but I'll think about it and <laughs> talk later. Everything was executed. <laughs> Yes, yes, let's go with that. Any other questions? Thank you for your lecture. Is the internal structure of the spaceship and the internal structure, do they match? Do they have any correlation? So, talking about the spaceship, is it bigger from the outside rather than from the inside? Or no, the it's one to one, exactly the same. Everything from inside and outside lines up perfectly. Um, it was really hard. <laughs> I wish it wasn't. As a as a creator, it was really hard, but it's more reward rewarding. So, um, no, it's it's as big as it is. Yeah. And you can go everywhere in the station. That's another thing that's really cool about Prey is, I mean, I've, I've worked on, we've all worked on games that there's doors with no handles that are fake and you can't go. No, not in Prey. Every door opens and goes to a location. And then you can go outside and, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing. Cool. Uh, hello, and thank you for great speech and great game. Thank you. And, um, uh, I was uh, wondering, uh, in a prey, um, the most horrifying location is Psionic Lab for me. <laughs> it's a place where is, uh, everything begins. Uh, so, um, could you please tell um, which location, uh, what story tells? Uh, I think it's uh, different. I mean, for uh, hub location, for uh, uh, I don't know where is um, uh, not Morgan, but uh, the other brother. Um, uh, Alex. Uh, Alex, yes. Yeah. Um, office location. Mm -hmm. uh, I played three months ago. I forget. Okay. forget. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, could you please tell um, w what location, what story tells? Uh, well, I'm sorry, what location and what? Uh, which location? I mean. Um, uh, Oh, what is uh, the differences between uh, oh, locations okay. and stories? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, well, you mentioned psychotronics as being very scary. Psychotronics was different than probably most of the other levels, all the levels really, because narratively, fiction-wise, it is the original location where the very first alien was discovered in space. And uh, in the backstory, uh, again, the game took place in uh, the space age, 19, you know, late 50s. Uh, and we made an alternate version of history where when the Russians went to space, they were up in space repairing a satellite and they discovered an alien. And instead of, you know, obviously the, you know, the U.S. and, the, and the Russia was, you know, things were going on then. But in our version of the story, the Russians came to the U.S. and said, "Just let's put this aside. We have a problem, and we're the only people. We have to join forces to do it." And so that's how our game kind of starts. And we kind of had to show that a little bit uh, in Psychotronics. So you get the original Kletka, which is the the apparatus that contains the uh, the alien uh, outbreak. And so that one was interesting because we had to show all the alien stuff. But then the deeper you got in, we had to start showing Russian influence, which was not really anywhere else in the game. But we, we referred to it in news, you know, or magazine articles and stuff like that. But then you get there and it was just like, 
now it's like Russian influence. And like as the art team, it was like, okay, we don't have anything Russian influence in the game, so we have to make a whole bunch of new art and stuff to support that. Um, so that was, a, that was an example of um, different storytelling that we had to do to tell a story that was, I think, important you know, to the backstory, so you understood where it all started. So it's whether the last question or over. Okay, last one. <laughs> Thank you for your speech. Uh, the question is, did you need to explain to some big boss that you need uh, resources and budget for all these little uh, things to place uh, in the game to all this right. uh, stuff uh, that it is important and uh, what was your arguments? Thank <laughs> you. Um, well, so like I said in my talk, one of the reasons that I personally went to Arcane, and I know a lot of people go to Arcane, is because we don't have to make that argument. That's what we do at Arcane. That's what they've always done at Arcane. And people like me who have always done it at other studios, you know, and fought for it at other studios, we came here and it's like, it's awesome. You don't have to fight for it. People expect you to do it. Um, so I can't really talk about it from that perspective. I mean, I guess I could say at previous studios, it's not that they didn't value it, it's just that like we're trying to make this particular kind of game and this takes extra resources and, and is it really important? And I would always argue, as I hopefully did in my presentation, that um, if you want people to care about your game, it's an important way to do it, is to, to, to make it more real, more believable, more personal. And if you can show that you can do that well and efficiently, and quickly, <laughs> um, people tend to listen, um, at least in my experience. So. Eric, today you told us a great story, and we thank you for that. Thank you. catching our speakers in the hallway and putting cameras in front of them. Hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Samuel Rantaskla. I work for uh, Microsoft as a principal program manager out of Sweden. Okay, Samuel, so let's talk about games. What's your favorite game? Well, I wish I played a lot more games than I actually do, so I have to go back into the past. Like, one of my m really favorite games is Jag the Lions 2 from like 92, 93. I think it was made here in Russia if I'm not mistaken. Civilization, always been a big fan of that. And then the Enemy Unknown UFO trilogy from 
the 90s. There's so many games, I mean, it's like impossible to select one. But they're all strategic games, the ones that are my favorite. Yeah, you're obviously a tactician. That's commendable. But do you remember the very first game you've ever played? Uh, Decathlon, probably on the x86, somewhere around 84. Wow, that's... Uh, I don't even remember that one. Um, oh, it's like a, you basically play uh, decathlon and you just hammer at the keyboard to go faster, like 10, 10 different sports events. Played it like crazy. I was eight years old then. <laughs> wow. Uh, how did you get in the, uh, into the gaming industry? It was by chance, actually. So I was studying at Uppsala University doing uh, computer science, and they had this fair uh, where companies were meeting the students. And there was these two guys that they've started a game company in the basement and they wanted somebody to write a BSP tree, binary space partitioning tree. And I was looking for my thesis, so I figured let's combine those. So I joined them, I wrote my thesis uh, in the games industry, and then from there I kind of like just went on. So this was 2000. Uh, but now in 2017, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about game dev? I mean, I think the games industry is awesome. Great place to work. There's so much passion. Um, there's skilled, very intelligent people. Uh, I think that's my favorite thing. Uh, the least favorite thing is that, which I covered in my speech a little bit, I think that we're looking a little bit too much at how do we turn time into money uh, rather than seeing like how do, we, how do we educate our kids. I really want to, that's my passion myself, it's like, take this experience, make our kids better today, tomorrow than they are today. I'm a parent as well, so that's coming from that. Well, that's a very noble thing to do. I don't know if noble, just I think it would be a good thing for us. Definitely. Is. Um, about your speech, did you have any interesting questions that maybe stood out? Yeah, there was some uh, interesting questions like if we look at mixed reality, what's going to happen with that? What's the dangers with that? I couldn't really answer them because it's, let's see what happens. But if you were a part of your own audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Hmm, that was a tricky one. Um, are you sure that you're right? Are you? No. Well, we can be sure 100%, but still, we're trying to foresee the future here. How do you like the conference? Love it. St. Petersburg, great place, wargaming, excellent hosts. It's a great place to be. You should come to the next one. Definitely do. Uh, say, if you had the chance to go back in time uh, to when you just started working in the industry and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Try one of your ideas out. That's very good. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, I hope you like, you like the conference. Thank you. We got another one of our speakers uh, here at 4C and uh, would like to ask him some questions. Hi, uh, please introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Eric and I'm the CEO of the Do Dreams Game Studio based in Helsinki, Finland. Very nice to meet you, Eric. Uh, tell me, what's the very first video game you've ever played? Uh, I guess when I was a little kid, my dad was in banking and he had a lot of business trips and he went to Japan. and he brought me one of these Nintendo uh, handheld like small small games it probably was Donkey Kong so that's my first memories with gaming and then I played a lot of Oil Panic with the Disney characters so fond memories with those uh, favorite uh, gaming memories well I like games that I can play with my friends 
I remember when I was in high school, we'd go visit my friend's house and we played a lot of these uh, like sports games together, like uh, NHL 95 and some F1 racing games. So I would say that maybe NHL 95 is, is the game that I have played most with my friends and I have fond memories of, you know, starting after school and then realizing this like 2 a.m. and uh, knowing that my mother will be very angry when I come home late. <laughs> that happened to all of us, I think. Uh, how did you start in the video game industry? What led you here? Uh, I was earlier a marketing uh, lecturer at this business school in Helsinki. And then at some point I realized that instead of talking about business, that I'd like to do business, business myself. Uh, I had my own startup for three years, uh, did uh, different kinds of entertainment apps. I was interested in storytelling and apps and online and social media. Uh, after that, uh, I, I, I did that for three years, failed miserably. But I guess the one thing I learned was to how to test concepts early with real customer data. Because when you have little money, you need to be sure that you're, you're spending it wisely. And um, I had the opportunity to join an existing team. So I joined Do Dreams as a CEO. And uh, together with the wonderful team I have there, we, we, we uh, started with these mini games, eventually came up with Drive Ahead, which is our current franchise that we're developing. Sounds great. Uh, tell me what... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, what's uh, your favorite thing about uh, the video gaming industry, or maybe just something you strongly like about it? I think the my favorite thing about the gaming industry is the community of developers. So, uh, traveling around the world, meeting wonderful people who make games. And, and you know, talking to people and learning from them. I think it's really cool how in gaming people are very open to share their experiences uh, about you know the business aspect of running a game studio, management stuff, uh, you know, tips and advice on on scaling and growing a company. It has been very useful for me, and and hopefully by giving talks at events like this, maybe I can give something back to the to the community. Oh, you definitely are. Uh, Anything that maybe irritates you or something you don't like about the industry, strongly dislike? Well, uh, I think in recent years, like, uh, you know, games are developed with data and analytics. And that's, of course, very important. And I think all decisions, all the creative decisions should be based on, on data. But what I've noticed, noticed is that um, studios maybe give up quite easily on games and, and their communities. So we have found that, that uh, if we really invest in the community and take care of the players by making regular updates to the game, thinking the game, of the game not as a product but as a service, then the community will support you through difficult times. Uh, what trends do you think are going to persist or maybe appear anew uh, in like a 10 years time? Let's make a prediction. Oh, that's, uh, that's a very tricky question. So with uh, everything developing so fast, I guess it's really difficult to say. Um, I'm very excited about AR. So our studio, we launched our first augmented reality game, Drive Ahead Mini, Mini Golf, just yesterday. So I'm very interested in seeing how this market will develop in the next uh, year or two. If you look at 10-year 10, 10 perspective, then maybe games will be everywhere. Maybe like your glasses could be uh, a, a platform for playing games. I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. so maybe, you know, like uh, it will be very interesting to see what kind of sessioning games will have when people could basically be playing all the time. Uh, what do you think uh, is uh, more important uh, in a game, like one of its aspects, uh, the ever-discussed questions, the graphics, the gameplay, the game design, uh, the storytelling maybe? Um, we usually start with a fun core gameplay. So, of course, we want to make fun, cool games. But we found that that's not enough. So you need to make sure that uh, your players have a reason to return to the game often. 
and they want to return with their friends. So I think planning this progression and making sure that there are some kind of events like live operations, I think that's very important. And though everybody knows monetization is important, like just thinking of the the path the player takes in the game and when when are they presented with opportunities to spend money or watch videos or do something like that like connecting the revenue model with making the game experience better i think that's that's very crucial uh, do you have a vision of a video game you'd like to create if you weren't restricted in absolutely no way like financially creatively there's only one right answer to this, and that is that if we would have no financial restrictions, we would be doing the exact same thing that we're doing now. So I believe that the format that we have developing games with minimum risk and investment, testing concepts early with players, and, and launching games thanks to this wonderful, large and active community that we have with, uh, with Drive Ahead is the way that we would want to do it you know, regardless of what kind of budget we have. Sounds fair. Uh, let's come back to the real world for a moment. What do you think about St. Petersburg? St. Petersburg is a wonderful place. We've been blessed by wonderful weather this time. Uh, I heard from the locals that we're very lucky to enjoy this nice weather. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit St. Petersburg uh, three times during the last year for a couple of events. And I'm always excited to meet the local developers. Uh, our drive ahead game uh, on Android Russia is the largest market for us and, and this is something that we, we want to understand better like why people like the game here and, and, and see how we as a studio could be more present in Russia and, and be closer to our flat fans, the players on, on Russian social media. So that's why I'm always interested to, to visit Russia and meet people if I have the chance. Well now you have the chance, another one. Um, at this. Uh uh, event for C, and what do you think about it? Uh, I've had a chance to talk at many international events in China and the US GDC and places in Europe. I think uh, 4C is the best organized event I've ever been to. You, know, you guys are taking really good care of the guests and, and the lineup is awesome. So uh, I'm giving a talk myself, but uh, the rest of the time I have a full schedule of listening to presentations. So usually when you go, I go to these international conferences, I'm quite tied up with meeting partners. But here I'm really going to enjoy going to the talks myself and hearing what the experiences people share. Uh, and if you were interviewing yourself right now, what question would you like to ask yourself? <laughs> what question would I like to ask myself? I'd probably ask that why do I have this wonderful beard? Why do you? Well, I'll tell you guys a secret. So I'm actually the great great-grandson of Santa Claus and that's why I have this beard and and Santa Claus said to me that you have to learn how to bring people of the world joy so that's why for the next about 200 years I'm gonna be the CEO of the Do Dreams game studio and one day in about 200 years when my beard is all white then I will become the next Santa Claus really looking forward to it and from the presence from you. Uh, what are you looking forward to? What's uh, maybe the speech that you'd like to hear most? Anything specific? I love all these like demos and, and case studies that people do. I, I, I really like the, the talks where, where people go through some project and, and, and go through their experiences. So, so I'm, I have several of those in my schedule. Great. Sounds exciting. And now children all, all over the world are excited for a new Santa. And uh, I hope you have a good time here. Thank you. Thank you.